a fresh look in the mirror. Now, I take it you probably already captured the reflection that this kitty is seeing in the mirror. And that's important because there is a reflection that God wants you to see, the reflection of himself, the reflection of Imago Dei, that you are created in his image, and the reflection of the power of God's work within your life, the transformational love that redefines who you are as an individual. God wants you to see something quite beyond what our physical eyes see as we look in the mirror. This will build you up. This will also help you break through. And we're going to do that together this year. As we begin this morning, take your Bible in hand, please. Stand with me if you would. And let's make this very important and declaration together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You may be seated, my dear ones. All right. We're going to be turning to James chapter 1, and as you are turning to that, i got to tell you about this private school in Washington State. They had a problem with the junior high school girls that had discovered lipstick because the girls were putting their lipstick on in the girls' bathroom, and then they were kissing the mirror to put their lip prints on the mirror. Well, this was creating a real mess for the janitor to clean up at night. And he was having a challenge scrubbing off all these lipstick things. Well, finally, in order to curb this problem, the principal called all these junior high girls crowding into the ladies' room for the janitor to explain that this was creating a mess. They had announced it several times. It made no difference. But the janitor said, I think I can solve the problem. And he said, let me show you how hard it is for me to have to clean this off of the mirror. And he takes the squeegee and he dunks it in the toilet. And then he takes the squeegee and he washes off the mirror. And after that, not one of those junior high girls kissed that mirror again. <laughs> There are teachers, and there are educators. <laughs> oh, yes, as we look at another mirror this morning, James chapter number 1, verses 21 through 26. Therefore, laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does." If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but dis he deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. That's a powerful statement. In order to understand what we're sharing today, let me put it into the context of where we have come from two weeks ago. We began talking about this concept of our words. Now, as we get ready to launch into this, and as I go through this review, I want you to do something important for me. I want you to interact with me on this opening question. How do you feel about yourself when you look in a mirror? You look in a mirror. Some people, they don't want to look in a mirror. When you look in a mirror, what percentage positive feelings do you have what percentage of negative feelings do you have? Do you look in the mirror and it's like, eee, I don't want to look in the mirror. I know some people that they say it's 100% negative. I know some people that can spend a lot of time in front of the mirror. 
And you might think they feel it's 100% positive, but it's because they are struggling with the negative that they're working so hard to make something positive. You tell me from your perspective in your own life, what percentage of the feelings you have when you look at yourself in the mirror are positive versus negative? We'll have a few of those come together. I'm going to share those with you in just a few moments after I do the review and frame where we're walking together today. Now, one other thing, I guess I'm supposed to mention this. This is very important. I put my number up there for you to text. That means people know what my number is. If you're not aware yet, people can send a text and make it look like it comes from a number that it doesn't come from. That's how they do scams. You need to know there's some text scamming going around where people are saying, taking a pastor's phone number, sending a text to the parishioners and saying, I need you to go out and buy gift cards and send me the numbers of your gift cards because we're doing it for this family. I will never text you about asking for money, gift cards, or anything like that, okay? Be aware, if you get a text from my number and it says, could you go out and buy this or could you go out and get this and it's about money, it's not from me, okay? Everybody got that? I want to keep you safe and protect it. Unfortunately, there are a lot of scammers out there. This last week, I had one of them call me again to tell me about my car insurance. My car um, warranty was expired. I figured I needed to keep him on the phone because the longer I kept him on the phone, that was the less time he had to scam you. So he, he's asking me about, all, about my vehicles, and I told him, well, I got my 19... Excuse me, my 2019 Corvette that I bought because it matched my wife's eyes and my 2005 Ferrari. Now, I bought that in 2000, and I was just going on with my story. And I kept him on the phone for at least 10 minutes. And I figured that was a lot of time he spent not being able to scam you. But eventually, he didn't, he didn't like my story, and he hung up on me. How rude. He didn't even tell me what it was going to cost to warranty my Ferrari and my Corvette. And those of you that are online and maybe don't know, I, I'm playing a, a joke on this guy. I don't have a Corvette or a Ferrari. I did give my wife a Ferrari once. I did. A little matchbox one. <laughs> and it was a pretty little one, red one because she wanted a Ferrari, so I gave her a little matchbox Ferrari. No, I have a 2002 Chevy truck. Uh, 2013 Chevy Cruze and an 08 Harley. That's what I have. <laughs> but I played a little fun. Figured if he was going to call me on my phone, he's going to have some fun playing together. All right, breaking through. Breaking through. Fatalism versus faith. This is where we started talking. The fatalistic view in life is the inevitable or necessary fate to which a particular person or thing is destined. It means it's your lot. You're stuck in it. You can't change anything. It's a predetermined course of events considered as something beyond human power or control. No power, no control. That's a fatalistic view. It's just the way I am. I can't do anything about it. I'm stuck this way. I will never beat this addiction. I'll never be able to overcome this problem. It's just who I am. But the faith view says, uh-uh, no way. Destiny is the end result of my choices. It's an open course where you may not control all the events, but you do control the responses. And through Christ, you can do all things. Fatalism is not part of Christianity because we are men and women of faith. Then in part number two, we talked about breaking words and highlighted Psalm 107, verse 2. Therefore, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It does not say think so, believe so, or hope so. It says, say so. God calls you to verbalize, to say so. Verbalize your redemption. Then in part three, we said, why do we need to say so? Well, the reason is the same word in Psalm 107.2 is also the same in 
Genesis 1 verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And you see it over and over again. God said, God said, God said, God said. It's important to understand that it does not say God thought, God wished, or God hoped. It said God said, He spoke, and nothing happened until God spoke. That's a principle there of speaking in creation and a principle that applies to your life as well. You need to say so in agreement to God's Word. Verbalize it. Verbalize His perfect and complete redemption. And you need to use your words to not pessimistically describe, but to instead positively direct your life. Romans chapter 4 we learn that you have control over your words, so therefore you need to use them to transform your life. Now let's go to that James passage, because I'm going to highlight just one part of that James passage. Verse number 26, if anyone among you thinks he's religious, doesn't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, his religion's useless. You need to get control over your tongue over the things that you say. And stop belittling yourself. Stop taking and deprecating yourself. Stop knocking yourself around. Stop saying what you can't. Stop limiting yourself by your words because you are putting barriers up and blocks in your life. You have control over your words. You need to use them to transform your life. And if you use your words just to describe negatively rather than to direct positively, you are going to be finding your religion, your faith is useless. It's not going to get you anywhere. Because faith requires verbalization of say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Words can really change your brain. That is a book by Dr. Andrew Newberg, neuroscientist at Thomas Jefferson University and Mark Waldman, a communications expert. I gave you just a sample of that quote. A single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. The words you speak, even a single word, has the power to influence the expression of your life genetically. You need to be careful with your words. So now we'll take it into this next portion. Based on all of that, it's time to look at mirror, mirror on the wall. Do you remember that? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? We're going back to Disney, 1937, and Snow White. And she's looking into the mirror, right? Not Snow White, but the evil witch. Looking into the mirror. Who's the fairest of them all? What is she doing? She's being a fool. Because the Bible says, those that compare themselves among themselves, measuring themselves by themselves, are not wise. She was doing what was not wise. That makes it a fool. God wants you to take the mirror and not use it to compare yourself to others, but to see yourself from God's perspective in a whole new way. Mirrors have been something that have been around for a long time, obviously. And the basis of that Snow White story and looking at the mirror, that's actually built upon ancient Greece. And Mercedes, of course, she knows the story of Narcissus because she knows a lot of the ancient Greek history and the stories. And... Well, Narcissus, where we talk about somebody that's a narcissistic person, in ancient Greece, Narcissus looked at his reflection in the water and was so enamored by himself, he was narcissistic. That's where we get it from. He just couldn't stop staring at how beautiful he was, and he starved himself to death. Now, there is a story there about vanity. There's a story there about foolishness. And that's carried into not only a Snow White story, it's carried on to us 
all throughout our lives and calling us to take a look in the mirror with caution and with wisdom. And let's talk about your looking in the mirror together. Here are some of the thoughts you have. When I shave, I look into the mirror to find areas I missed. Therefore, I look for flaws to correct. It has both the negatives, the flaws, but also some positive corrections. That's interesting. And here this person says it's about 50-50. I feel 50% positive and 50% negative. This brother or this sister says used to be 30% positive, but as I built my faith in God's word, the positivity grows every day. I love that. Oh, I'm so glad it is growing. That's wonderful. All right. Here's another one. Uh, this one says about 75% positive to 100% positive. Sister says, good to see it growing. This brother says, about 50-50. 50% positive, 50% negative. This one says 80% positive, but dropping yearly. You're basing it wrong, my brother. <laughs> You're not getting older. You're becoming seasonedly handsome. And this says it's about neutral. It's about half and half. This one says, whoever said that these are the golden years never lived past 40. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. And this one says, I feel like a beautiful masterpiece of God that I get to wake up every morning, be alive and breathing. Somebody has been allowing the Word of God to be a great influence that is so wonderful. We have some positives. We have some negatives. Reminds me of a time I was at a carnival, and they had a house of mirrors. Has anyone ever been in a house of mirrors? Slip your hand up. A, a good number of you. You know that experience is kind of unusual because you go in and you see yourself in all these different mirrors. There's some mirrors you look in and you look like you're really tall. And when I was a little kid, I thought that was pretty cool. Then you go to another mirror and it makes you look like you're really short. Another mirror makes you look really skinny. Another mirror makes you look really fat. Every single one of those mirrors that I was looking into, I was seeing a reflection of myself. It was me in the mirror. But the mirrors distorted my perspective. And that's one of the challenges you and I have in life. There are people that will mirror back to you their perspective of you. But if it's not based on the Word of God, their perspective is distorted. You need to see yourself in the mirror of God's Word, not in the perspectives of this world. The mirror, mirror on the wall can lead to so much distortion and misfocus. You need to be careful. You need to be wise. You see, God's Word then takes this powerful concept right here in the book of James, and it uses the concept of the mirror to illustrate our perception of ourselves in light of God's Word. Let's take a look at this deeper and understand it in mirror, mirror of the Word. We look together at James chapter 1, once again, if you would please. James 1, starting at verse 21. Now it says here, Therefore, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Lay aside. That means get this out of your life. All filthiness, which would be inappropriateness, garbage, wrong things coming out of your life, and overflow of wickedness. And these are strong statements. You need to get the garbage out of the life. And receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, the first thing it's calling us to do here is get the garbage out of your life. Why? So it doesn't have the opportunity to define who you are. That's the context of this. Because if you have a foul mouth where you're always using this blank word and this blank word, 
and you have a filthy mouth, people think that that is the definition of who you are. If you are putting things on Facebook that are sexually oriented, inappropriate, instead of recognizing the beauty and purity of sex in marriage, when you are doing that, that is filthiness. And that is inappropriate. And you see some people, their Facebook, they go from a wonderful comment about, I love Jesus, and then the next thing has a very inappropriate, filthy, sexually impure posting. I see some people go from a, a you know, serving God, loving, wonderful Facebook meme, to the next one, they got a bottle of booze. And that's the wickedness. God doesn't want you to have this garbage in your life. He doesn't want your life defined by alcohol. He wants your life defined by godliness. Take the garbage, get the garbage out of your life so it doesn't have the opportunity to define you. You are to receive the implanted word to produce God's image in your life. Receive the implanted word. Now this idea of receive the implanted word, does that mean you just lay down on your, on your Bible as a pillow and you'll receive it? No. Receive here is actually in the aorus imperative middle. Why is that important, Pastor? It's extremely important because the imperative means this is a command that God has given. It's not a, hey, I got a suggestion for you. No, this God's commanding you, take the garbage out. You don't take the garbage out to get saved. You come to Jesus just the way you are. But once you do come to Christ, you need to take the garbage out so it doesn't define you as a believer. Do you understand that? You come to Christ the way you are, but when you come to Him, it's time to get the garbage out of your life so you are reflecting Jesus and not the filthiness and the wickedness of the world. This is a command, not a, not a suggestion. And it's also in the middle voice in Greek. And that's really important because what this says is whenever it's in the middle voice, it means you are participating in the action and the results. It means God's not going to do it for you. It means you've got to take the garbage out. You've got to take the garbage out yourself. And when you do, you are going to get to participate in the results, the cleansing in your life the transformational process, the blessings that come from it, the new definition that results from it. You see, God wants to save your souls. Now some people think, well, save my soul, that means I get to go to heaven when I die. Yep, but that sure is not all that it is. It's a whole lot more than that. Soterios, the word for salvation, actually means a whole bunch of stuff. I don't have time to highlight it all, but let me just point out the word here for soul isn't the word your spirit in the sense of your spirit goes to be with the Lord. This is your psyche. It actually uses the Greek word psyche. <laughs> your soul's your psyche. What do we talk about? Psychology. Who you are as a person. Your psyche. God is able to save your psyche, who you are as an individual, as a person. God is able to transform you when? When you take the personal responsibility to get the garbage out of your life. Get rid of the filthiness. Get rid of the wickedness. So the definition of your life is not based upon the garbage, but rather based upon your relationship with God. In James chapter number 1 and verse 22, take a look there, please. Verse 22 now says, be doers of the word. It says, but be doers of the word. This is instead of the other garbage. This is a call of God to, instead of let the definition of your life be wickedness and filthiness, it's time to let the definition of your life, but instead be a doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving yourself. A doer, not a hearer. Now that word, doer of the word, Actually, poetai, the Greek word here, means that you become the author of your condition. 
You take charge of your life to break through. This is where free will, once again, becomes so incredibly important in the Christian life. Because these are decision points. The first verse of 21 here that we looked at, it is all about decision points. Clean up your life. Take the garbage out. The second verse that we're looking at here, verse 22, it says, you are to become the author of your condition by taking charge of your life to break through. Some people, they, they wonder, you know, I just never seem to get ahead. Well, you can't get ahead if you're just going to sit on the couch, right? You need to take action and recognize you have responsibility as the author of your condition. Now, Jesus will save you, but then he calls you to live your life for him and to in the fullness of everything that you do, do it as unto Him, the very best that you can do, as if you are doing everything just for Him. Take charge of your life to break through. Don't wait for it to happen. Rise up in the name of Jesus, directed by His Word, as a man or a woman of faith, and do it. Be a doer of the Word, a take charge person. Now the warning here is not to deceive yourselves because we can deceive ourselves pretty easily and instead of being the victors, we can just have a victim mentality. And I've seen a lot of people do that in life. Well, I'm, you know, I just can't you know, get ahead and I can't break through and I just have all these problems and I'm never going to be able. To. And they just can talk themselves out of anything good. And they're just a poor as me victim. Well, we have victory in Jesus. He's my Savior forever. And the battle belongs to the Lord. You're, and we're not just sitting there. We're going out in battle with the Lord. We're, we're walking in victory, right? I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. The declaration there. Don't deceive yourself. As a victim, you are, Romans 8, more than conquerors through him who has loved you. And it continues in the following verses then to explain it. Verse 22 said, don't be deceiving yourself. But then in verses 23 and 24, it says, For if anyone's a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he is. Let's take a look at this a little more. Not being a doer, not taking charge of your authorship of your condition, you end up being deceived. You need to be a doer, not a non-doer. And what does it look like to be deceived? It's a person who looks at themselves in the mirror and then they are forgetting, the scripture says, if they're not forgetting what they look like. That would be a mistake to think that that's what it is. It says, but what kind of person you are. It doesn't say what you look like, but rather what kind of person you are. Did you catch that? Look again. Verse number 24, he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he is. Not what he looks like. You see, the mirror is so important because the mirror doesn't just define a, a, what you look like, but God's Word explains that the mirror gives you more than just an image. It creates and it reinforces a definition of yourself. And when you look into that mirror, if you're not following through with God's Word in your life, you're going to forget what kind of person you are, that you are a blood-bought, blood-washed child of the living God. You're going to forget that you have been redeemed. You're going to forget it, and what you're going to do, you're going to start thinking those filthy thoughts, start living that wicked life, and posting it on Facebook, and people don't really know what kind of person you are other than well, they're a person that says they're a Christian, but then they go out and do all these other things and post all this other stuff, and they just can pretty much figure out you're just a hypocrite. Are you understanding me? And I don't mean that in a harsh and mean way. 
We need to make sure we look in the mirror and we're a doer of the Word so we don't forget what kind of person we are and have our life be defined by the wrong things rather than the godly things. So there's a promise here. Look at verse number 25, please. Verse number 25 then says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now just notice it also doesn't say a doer of the word. It's a doer of the work. The work. Because the word calls us to work. This man will be blessed in what he does. Again, I want you to say this right out loud with me. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You want to be blessed in what you do? You want your relationships to be blessed? You need to get your life to line up with God's Word, get the filthiness and wickedness out of your life. You want to be blessed in your work? You need to follow through and be a doer, defining your life by God's design and not by the wickedness and filthiness of this world, which is so pervasive. This is the perfect law right here of liberty. You see yourself in the perfect law of liberty, God's Word. He doesn't just look, but He continues in the Word. After He sees what kind of person He is, He says, this is what I'm going to be. This is the authoritative Word of God, the inerrant, infallible Word. I am what it says I am. That's what you said, isn't it? I am what it says I am. You need to believe that and to continue in that because there is for you and for I, for every single one of us, a potential to forget what you are in the midst of the negative voices around you. And there are a lot of negative voices around you in this world. A lot of negative voices that tell you you never amount to anything. You're not good enough. Why don't you just shut up and sit down and just stay out of the way? A lot of negative voices that will put you down, or like a lot of negative voices that will just, oh, you're just a racist. You're just an idiot. You're just a this or you're just a that. And they just want to try to label you and define you and negatively put a lid on you to prevent you from living out the life that God has for you. But there's a promise here that if you will be a doer, take charge to author your condition, you will end up blessed. You rise up. You take charge of your life. You start recognizing, I'm going to live my life the way God wants me to live it, and not under the peer pressure, not under the garbage of this world, and, I, and you will be blessed, it says. Now that word blessed happens to be the same word as blessed in the Beatitudes, makarios, which means happy. And it's not just happy personally, but you are happy to the point where people envy your life, where people look at you, and not in a negative envy, but in an envy that says, I want what that person has. I want to be like that person. I want to have my life be defined like theirs is. I want the positive encouragement they feel. They will look at your life and they say, I want what you are. Whatever you got, I want it. That's how we want to live. And if we will be people that will live out the Word of God in our lives, letting the redeemed of the Lord say so, it will be transformational. I'm going to tell you this. You need to look into God's Word as your mirror to define and reinforce who you are. Look in God's Word as the mirror to define and reinforce who you are you are. Now I'm going to continue this next week to tell you with what you need to take away and speak into that mirror and carry away from the mirror in part number two. But now to close I need to tell you another joke. I'm going to close with a joke. I opened with a joke on mirrors. I'm going to close with a, jo with a joke on Shlemiel. What is Shlemiel? Shlemiel is a Jewish archetype. It means it uses this name in order to give an illustration of a type of person. Shlemiel jokes are common in the Jewish community. 
I'm going to tell you one joke about Shlemiel. Shlemiel gets up in the morning, and Shlemiel goes and he puts in his toast and makes his coffee. He takes his toast and he butters his toast and he sets it on the edge of the table. He reaches for his coffee and he knocks his toast onto the floor and it falls butter side down. Every morning it's the same thing. Shlemiel gets up, Shlemiel makes the coffee, Shlemiel butters his toast, he butters the toast, he sets it on the edge of the table, reaches for his coffee, bumps the toast and it falls and it always falls. Again, butter side down. But one day... It's a new day. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. It's happy outside. Shlemiel gets up. He butters his toast. He puts it on the edge of the table. He reaches for his coffee. He knocks his toast. And the toast falls down. Butter side up. And Shlemiel's all excited. He goes running outside. Rabbi, Rabbi. He runs to the rabbi to tell him, Rabbi, Rabbi, I'm no longer Shlemiel. The rabbi says, Shlemiel, what are you talking about? He says, well, this morning I get up, I butter my toast, I set it on the edge of the table, I reach for my coffee, I bump my toast. It falls on the, on the floor, but it falls butter side up. I'm no longer Shlemiel. And the rabbi says, silly Shlemiel, this morning you buttered your toast on the wrong side. Now, we laugh at that, and that's part of the purpose of that joke, is to laugh at. Part of the joke is also to let people consider the Proverbs, and talks about how a fool returns to his folly, and that fools tend to just retain foolishness because they just keep walking in the same stupidity, making the same wrong choices, and you know people like that. They just always are having money problems. It's not that they don't have enough money, it's that they don't manage the money they get. You know people that are always having relationship problems. You know people that are always having some drama. People that are always... Ha and that's the shlemiel. But it, there's an element here that needs to go beyond the joke. Because as you will change to become a doer of the word and take responsibility for your life, you can break through in life. And as you take that personal responsibility and say, you know what, I've been doing the same thing, getting the same results, I need to change. I need to do things different. I'm going to do it God's way. I am going to surrender my life to God, and I'm not going to play games I am going to get totally serious with God. I am going to take the garbage out. I'm going to get the filthiness out of my life, and I'm going to get the wickedness out of my life. And I'm going to get serious with God, and I'm not going to be putting this on others. I'm going to be looking at myself on how I can do what I'm supposed to do. Not demanding from others what you can't do yourself. That would be a Pharisee. But a person who says, I'm, I'm serious. I'm going to get this life with God serious. God accepts me the way I am. Praise God for that. But now it's time for me to take responsibility for my condition and rise up and be a man or a woman of God to break through in life. And you can. And when they're going to have some people in your life that when you break through and you say, my toast fell butter side up, they're going to say, ah, you buttered the wrong side. You'll never get ahead. You'll never change. And you have to break through anyways. And I'm going to tell you about that Wednesday night. Be with us, 6 p.m. this Wednesday. In the meantime, stand with me as we close in prayer. It starts with the decision. That's the way I am, I come to Christ. That's why we have sung the song, Just as I am, without one plea, just as I am. That's how I come to you. God takes you just the way you are, and then God asks you to take the next step. Don't clean up your life to come to God. You clean up your life because you belong to God. Would you just pray with me right now? We're going to take a moment to surrender our lives. And if, would you bow your head for a moment, close your eyes? 
If anyone saying, either here or watching online, you say, and even if you're watching online, still raise your hand if you feel that God is speaking to you because God will see you even if I can't. You say, you know what, Pastor? I need to come to Jesus just the way I am. I need to have him take my life and, and forgive me and heal me. Just put your hand up. We're going to pray. Just pray it out loud, dear ones. Let's all pray together and say, Dear Jesus, just the way I am, that's how I'm coming to you. You know the garbage in my life. And I know this. You died for my sin. So I am sorry for it. I don't want to continue in it. I want your forgiveness for it. So I, I am sorry. Please forgive me. I accept you as Lord and Savior and surrender my life to you. I am redeemed by your precious blood. And so now, I'm going to take responsibility for my life. I'm not going to pass the buck. I'm not going to blame other people. I'm going to take responsibility for my condition and my direction. I will follow your word. I'll be a doer of the word. I will break through in Jesus' name. I will break through and a doer of your word. I thank you for the power. I thank you for the victory. Help me to get rid of all the wickedness, all the filthiness, to take the garbage out and honor you in the way that I live. It's my choice right here and now. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> That's right, little buddy. Amen. Thank you, my dear ones, for being with us today. Thank you for those who've shared these moments online. I hope this has blessed you. This Wednesday night, I'm going to encourage you with breakthrough anyways. And next Sunday, we'll talk about what to put into that mirror to take back out of it. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed.